It's Wednesday, December 3rd, 2014, and you're listening to Sin Boldly, the podcast, The Sign Your Name Project. I'm your host, Drake Comstock, and with me, as ever, is the ever-faithful Stephen Doss. Hi, everybody. On tonight's episode, we will touch briefly on the uh, protest movements that are kind of um, moving throughout the country. Um, and then spend a, a good amount of time talking about uh, the pop theology and the spirituality of Oprah. But we will start tonight with the news. So, so Stephen, it's, it's tough times here in America. It is. It is. Um, As uh, well, everyone knows, um, we've had two grand jury um, decisions come down, and a grand jury is basically: is there enough evidence to to assume that a crime might have been committed here? Yeah, to be to see if it's even worth having a trial. To see it's even worth having a trial. One was in Ferguson, Missouri, with Michael Brown. The evidence showed that. He was involved in a strong arm robbery, and then he was involved in a, I don't want to use the word fight, but a... Altercation. An altercation, thank you. An altercation with a police officer that ended up with him being shot and killed. Um, And then there was another, just came out today actually, another grand jury decision that said we're not going to indict a New York police officer that that was responsible for the death of a man after placing him in a chokehold and and basically choking Choking him to to death death. after Um, this man was was not complaining, was saying, hey, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Turns out he had asthma and his, he was, had some heart issues um, and it was just, yeah, and oh my goodness, and um, and the biggest thing that came out of this is it was a a white cop and an African American um, victim, mm-hmm. um, and we both have our opinions on them. We have very yep. strong opinions about them. We're also two white guys. Yep. And so we feel like as two white guys, our voices shouldn't be heard about institutional racism. Again, we have our opinions. We know it's there. Um, and <clears throat> excuse me. And we are in solidarity with those who are protesting, who when they walk down the street, they don't, they can't assume that it's officer friendly there to help. Um, but we can never feel that way. Yeah. That's white privilege right there. Yeah, that's true. That's, and that's all we want to talk about on the matter because, you know, we have a certain privilege that it, that we didn't earn. There is nothing in this world that I can ever do to not be white. True. Um, and or so, at least not to, I mean, at least not to have grown. You can't change the past. You can't change, you know, mm-hmm. how we grew up and the, um, the assumptions that come with that. Yeah. You know, I grew up in poverty, but if I were to walk down the street, you, most people would assume I wouldn't. Sure. I didn't. And even still, when you Mm -hmm. call the cops, you assume that's a helpful step. Yeah, yeah. Um, So, and and unfortunately, um, still in this country, uh, Mm -hmm. fifty years after, um, you know, major civil rights legislation, um, that's still not the case um, for too many Americans. Mm -hmm. And regardless of the facts of these individual cases, uh, you know, I'm no grand jury, I'm no legal expert. Um. These protest movements are not just reaction to these particular cases, um, but they're a reaction to a sense that there is unequal value placed on lives in this country. 
Mm -hmm. and that lives of African Americans, specifically young African American men, are not treated with equal value um, as as other lives, and that's incredibly unfortunate. And you know, there there aren't really words that can express you know, the deep tragedy that is that fact, Mm -hmm. um, that lives are weighted differently, um, Mm -hmm. based on color and circumstance in 2014. So again, this is probably as far as, you know, we can take this discussion because, you know, we're two privileged white guys and we, and, and we've talked, you know, we've tried to, express our, our thoughts on this before and it always butts up against this well yeah uh, you know we could mm-hmm. talk about the particulars of the case but in some ways that's almost irrelevant um, that does you know the particulars of the case of you know ooh, it, ooh, or whatever mm-hmm. doesn't take away the institutional you know and structural issues that underlie these, these mm-hmm. things um, of you know, of, of the situation that these men were put in. So, yep. it, it, yeah. So, I mean, the best thing we can do is just and be supportive, mm-hmm. pray, mm-hmm. Um, and... and ex- I mean, and examine yeah. your own thoughts. And examine your own thoughts. Hey, uh, some, I guess something I can say as a white guy is, is examine your own thoughts. Um, mm-hmm. There is, it is an easy thought process to drop into that someone who looks differently from you, and, and mm-hmm. however that is, um, is other than you. Yep. Um, but the, you know, the underlying, you know, theology of, certainly of Paul, um, and, and, and embedded in the gospel is no, that's mm-hmm. not the case. We are all children of God. Yep. And so fundamentally, we are all bound together in this one family grounded in, in God and in the reality of Christ. Mm-hmm. And so when you have those thoughts of that person is different or other than me, and it's patently untrue um, in the reality of God. In God's reality, there are no others. Right. There are only our siblings in Christ. Mm-hmm. And and it, it and it, it is easily it's it's tempting humans the human mind loves to categorize things. It's, oh yeah, I mean it's what the my brain is designed to do. We're we really, put things in categories. We put things in categories. We're apes. That's what monk, that's what apes do. Yeah, it's it's how um, uh, chimps navigate the forest. Thumbs. They uh, they categorize the trees that are going to work right. And anyway, it's very mm-hmm. interesting uh, chimp psychology. Um, <laughs> But you need to resist putting people in categories. Mm-hmm. It, it, as if those categories are like you and mm-hmm. not like you. Because fundamentally, they're all like you. We're all in this. This isn't, you know, this isn't African Americans versus white Americans. What it is is there is a problem within the human family. Yeah. There's a problem... This is a human issue. This is a human issue. There's a theologian that I have a lot of respect for named Esther Mambo. Um, And one of the things Esther says is that in dealing with AIDS, um, if one member of the body of Christ has AIDS, then the body of Christ has AIDS. Mm -hmm. I look at this in the same way, that if one member of the body of Christ is suffering from racial injustice, then the body of Christ is suffering from racial injustice. It's also somewhat of the logic um, between uh, James Cone's um, The Cross and the Lynching Tree. What is the name of the book? What is, something in the Lynching Tree. Cross and the Lynching Tree? Something. James Cone. Great theologian. Yeah. I can't remember things. But it's that same kind of logic that that if this is inflected on some member of the body of Christ, we as, the enti- as members of that body share in that. Um, we are not separate and we are not other. Um, and, and beyond that, I, I can't offer any more. I'm not going to be, you know, I'm not Anderson Cooper. I don't have a, the coin slot here where I can, you know, the deep <laughs> crease where I can show true concern. Um, mm-hmm. But, I, you know, I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't want this to turn into a show where, 
you know, two white guys pick apart the details of the case and de- the details of institutional racism in this country. Yeah. You know, I just want to leave it at fundamentally. They're all children of God. And if there yep. are any divisions, uh, black, white, gay, straight, mm-hmm. whatever, yep. um, those are artificial. Yep. Those are and not now, of God. Let's move on to a happier topic. Yeah. Or at least Rob Bell like and Oprah. Yep. In this week's discussion. Something I can get mad about on camera. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, I don't know if it's hitting the peak of one's career or the nadir of one's <laughs> career um, to get your own show on the Oprah Winfrey Network, but Rob Bell's is getting his own show on the Oprah Winfrey Network starting Whoa. at the end of this with the December 21st will premiere the Rob Bell Show on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Rob Bell um, was a successful megachurch pastor, um, you know, published, you know, very, you know, widely read kind of pop theology books, Sex God, Velvet Elvis, um, you know, thriving congregation, did the NUMA videos, was in many of the NUMA videos. Um, which most certainly my youth group watched. I bet yours did too. Um, and he published a book called Love Wins, where he distanced himself from the idea of hell and damnation, which really freaked out many. He's he's his more evangelical colleague. He was kind of an evangelical mega church pastor. Um, kind of maybe on the article I re- read on HuffPo said he might have been on track to be like the next Billy Graham. And then he backs off on the the kind of a very strong sense of hell and the evangelicals turn his back, turn their back. And I mean, and he's also in 2013 came out um, in favor of same sex marriage, um, Mm. which is cool. Um, But lately he's, he's been teaming up with Oprah and Oprah and getting his own show on Oprah. Oprah impersonation. Dead on. So he, Here's what here's his thoughts on Oprah. This is a quote from Rob Bell. Mm -hmm. Um, The Oprah about Oprah quote. She has taught me more about what Jesus has for all of us and what kind of life about that money wants us to live more than almost anybody in my life. Is she a Christian? That word has so much baggage. I wouldn't want to answer for someone. When Jesus talks about the full divine life, you think this is what he's talking about. Oprah. Um, Oprah has always kind of had a vaguely spirit or overtly spiritual dimension to what she's doing. Um, She often has her guests talk about their religious beliefs. The, The famous comment that keeps coming up in a class I'm taking at Candler is where Madonna was on talking about Kabbalah and kind of Oprah worked really hard to kind of reduce Kabbalah down to its nugget of like whatever it is being intentional in the world or something and she's like well if that's the case then I could be then I've always been a Kabbalist or you know that Mm -hmm. I could do Kabbalah too that it's kind of this flattening of all religion into this milieu of positive spirituality Mm -hmm. Um, which in some ways is a lot of this kind of pop theology thing it's like you know faith is easy or faith is can easily be drilled down to like your five points of living well even the Pope listed his top ten um, ways to you know be happy in the world or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, Steve, what, what's your thoughts on, on, on Rob Bell getting his, uh, his, his show on Oprah? Uh, the, he's well, the Christian Dr. Phil. He's the Christian Dr. Phil. He's the Christian Dr. Oz. Oh, God. Um, Give me Phil over Oz any day. This is one of those... Um, uh, when you associate yourself with Oprah... Uh-huh. That, that is like, you officially lose all credibility. <laughs> well, I was because Oprah is a product. Oprah is <sighs> yeah, yeah. Oprah is there to sell products, um, and her product just happens to be these people, right? 
the Dr. Phil and Dr. Oz. Well, and Dr. Oz is doing a great job of selling his own products, too. I, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, everything... He's supporting supplement and sales. Yeah, everything is that miracle cure. His words, not mine. Yeah, his words. <laughs> and Rob Bell is now on that level. Yeah. Um, just by association. And maybe, you know, maybe that's not Oprah's intention. Who knows? Um, what we have is... Um, what we have is Rob Bell associating himself with, with Oprah, and Oprah has the stigma attached to her that she is consumeristic, that she does just she does just enough to get people um, on her side by saying, you know, yeah, I do this with my money. I'm yeah, and that's great. Keep doing good work." Um, if you've got the means to do it, do it. But don't place this as, you know, Dr. Phil is the self-help guru now. Dr. Oz is this medical guy who should be have his credentials taken away as quickly as possible, but who millions of people say, like, he's the guy that we associate medical medicine with. Right. And now Rob Bell is Christianity. Yeah. Um, in the mind of a lot of people because he is associated with Oprah. And Oprah, there's a cult around Oprah. Let's mm -hmm. be honest with ourselves. Right. There's the Oprah, cult of Oprah. Oprah is certainly a, you know, a religious leader. Right? Yeah. Yeah, she is. Um, whether she likes it or not. What? And, oh. and she likes it. She's she seems just, to just like it just fine. Yeah, just looking at her and reading about her and stuff, she's very much she enjoys it um and now rob bell is the religious leader and so again people are going to see theology as rob bell's theology not as actual theology actual theology is dirty actual theology is sad and depressing sometimes Act sure. sometimes actual theology is not just hey maybe there's not a hell actual theology is Let's discuss the nature of hell. Yeah. If well, there is one, we have to discuss the nature of it. If there's not one, why do we not think, or why do we not think that? What is our concept of God when it comes to hell? Right. Um, it's very dirty. But also, you know, I think this is the problem with a lot, certainly with TV-based ministry, is real theology is about relationships. And real preaching, in some ways, isn't just grounded in being in front of people. Mm -hmm. uh, preaching, in some ways, gains its strength because of the relationships you've built with the people. You know them. You mm -hmm. are a pastor to them. Yep. And in that way, you gain a tr – there is a trust – that they understand where your words are coming from. And so you can say, you know, challenging things. I, I mm -hmm. you know, I, I preach social justice in rural North Georgia. Now, I do it in a way that makes sense to them. Um, but, I mean, fundamentally, I preach social justice in rural North Georgia. I get yep. away with that, and I, you know, the church is doing well. I, mm -hmm. You know, and I certainly am, am not in the process of being run out of town. Because I've built the relationship with these people. Mm -hmm. And so we can really dig in to the messiness of theology and try to mm -hmm. navigate it together. Anytime you throw that onto television, yeah. where you have a person that is, you know, an object mm -hmm. um, on a screen, you don't have that relationship. And you right. don't have that interaction. And so... It, it's difficult to, you know, I mean, some televangelists are just there for your money. And, and right. I, I don't think that, I mean, I, I'm willing to, you know, grant Rob Bell that he thinks this is a way to reach people. Mm -hmm. Right? Kind of like Duck Dynasty, actually. Duck mm -hmm. Dynasty. So, funny but idea. You want to talk Duck about. Duck Dynasty is probably a bit more enjoyable than a Rob Bell show. Who, who knows? I, I watch, <laughs> or look, I watch Duck Dynasty. I, I've watched. I watched the episodes. They're, it's a terrible show. Um, but I, I bring up Duck Dynasty because just, you know, Duck Dynasty, 19 Kids and Counting 
are both shows, reality shows, that the actual participants are doing as a way of evangelizing. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the theology you see on screen is this kind of Oprah-ish, um, God is what holds us together yeah. kind of theology. And then Michelle Duggar is doing robocalls in Arkansas to defeat the to keep the gay marriage ban going. So, mm-hmm. like, there's the darker side that you don't see. Mm-hmm. Um, but th- they're all this kind of, yeah, faith is this, like, happy thing that holds us together. And, yeah, yes. Yeah. But that, it's more than that. And it's mm-hmm. much more complicated than that. And it's certainly more complicated than a talk show on the Oprah Winfrey Network. Yeah. Or maybe, I mean, look, you know. Maybe, Maybe we can, you know, the entire nature of God can be discussed in an hour. But, and, like, you, uh, know, yeah. you know, I don't host a talk show on the Oprah Winfrey Network, but I try to discuss the nature of God one hour a week, you know, <laughs> to a certain extent. You but know. we also we also try to do it in a way that's that's not as safe as what you have to be if you're in. Sure. If you've got the Oprah Book Club sticker on. Sure, it's hard to um, be prophetic mm-hmm. um, when you have advertising money depending on your show. I mean, l- yep. I mean let's l- let's be clear. Um, good preaching, you know, good preaching come and, and, and kind of religious leading mm-hmm. is hard to do when you're worried about making advertisers mad. It's the same thing with news and yeah. news commentary. Um. But yeah, I I don't know. I don't do I don't really do news commentary. I do preaching, whether it's on this mm-hmm. show or in church or whatever. And it just seems a little weird to have that tied to ad revenue. Um, yeah, and that's the problem with this theology is it's always tied to revenue. Joel Osteen oh God, as I, you know. Book deals. Don't ever get me started about Joel. Creflo, I'll be here Creflo, all night. Creflo Dollar. You know, God wants him to have a fleet of Rolls Royces. Um, God gives Joel Osteen one Ferrari a year. Yep. Limited to one Ferrari. Limited a to year. one Ferrari. And year. that man spends more money on his hair than I <laughs> spend on cat food. It's just. <laughs> but the thing is, it's it's all designed to sell a product, which is. God wants you to be happy, and it's easy if you just let Jesus in your life, rather than saying Jesus was a racist that one time. Yeah, I th- remember when he talked about the Samaritans? Woman, yeah, yeah. Or by saying, "What do we do with that part in Isaiah where um, the prophet in Isaiah three writes that um, because you God left us, we sinned. This is all your fault, God." Sure. Yeah. I mean, what do you do with uh, lament and the dark night of the soul, mm-hmm. and the con? You know, the conflict that's inherent in Acts and Paul, mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. books. The books written by Paul. I, th- there's a. It's hard to collapse theology, mm-hmm. and it's hard to collapse it in, into something that's going to fit into this format. Whether it's, I mean, Rob Bell's kind of who we're picking on because that's the news, but yeah, it, it's not like this hasn't been done before. It's right. just Oprah is such like a generically spiritual b- brand that mm-hmm. kind of fitting perfectly into the spiritual but not religious, which yeah. is one of my least f- f- like it's one of those things that me and my congregation agree on is the idea of spiritual but not religious. It's just like, so it's mm-hmm. you're making some claim it benefits with none of mm-hmm. the difficult stuff, um, the God and Jesus stuff. <laughs> and, you know, it gets complicated and. You know, you look at the theologians that we really value, very few of them had comfortable lives. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of them were just stone-cold academics. Um, looking at you, Carl Bart. <laughs> um, <laughs> but you look at folks, you know, the, the folks I, I spent a lot of my life reading, Bonhoeffer and Martin Luther mm-hmm. King, both killed uh, for their beliefs. And, you yeah. know, the disciples mostly died for their beliefs. Jesus died, mm-hmm. rose again, but died uh, for his beliefs. Like, there's a certain level of commitment um, to really living out your faith. Or you even look at someone like Clarence Jordan, who lived a very deliberately simple life. Um, 
because of his faith commitments. And, you know, does a talk show on Oprah and $200 on your hair really jive with that? Or a team of stylists looking after your whatever? Um, yeah. Hey, I think it's the same struggle that Pope Francis is continuing to deal with from going from this, like, simple living cardinal and high school teacher to mm-hmm. being the Pope in living in the Vatican, preaching in St. Peter's. It, mm-hmm. And he kind of goes like, no, drive me around in a Hyundai. What, what's this Mercedes doing here? And I, I can start to understand it. Um, I always joke there's an inverse relationship between the effectiveness of ministry, the amount of money you've spent on your hair. This applies mm-hmm. only to male preachers. I don't know what the equivalent is for <laughs> female preachers yet. I have not worked this scenario out. But I'm mm-hmm. convinced that, and, and I see this, as churches grow, pastors start spending more money on their hair. Um, so I think I have decided that I'm not going to do, like, if I, you know, Lord willing, if I ever in a church that, you know, in a big church that's growing, I'm not, I'm just going to keep doing the same thing where I use baby shampoo and then I go like this. So it's all <laughs> vaguely pointing in one direction. I need to do something with my hair. Or, or don't like, I don't know. Um, pop theology becomes popular often because it cuts out what's difficult yep this you know and this isn't universally true i think shane claiborne for all his faults um, ah hippie mcno shower yeah sure hippie mcno shower like whatever you want to say he at least keeps it difficult yeah he does not reduce it down to the your three simple ways to be happy in life you know his theology has its problematic elements and is a little white savior-ish if you want to be perfectly yeah, it is. honest. Let's be honest. That's why I call him Hippie McNo Shower. This is not this <laughs> is not an outright defense of Hippie McNo Shower. Okay, good. What this is, however, is at least to point out that although it is pop theology, it is at least pop theology that keeps the Christian life difficult. Mm-hmm. That does not just totally flatten the Christian existence into let's be happy and hug each other. Mm-hmm. That's as far as I'm going to give Hippie McNo Shower credit. Mm-hmm. But I think it is important to mention that. Yeah. Because as pop theology goes, he ain't bad. This is a genre of literature <laughs> I can't stand. But given that, um, mm-hmm. he's not bad. Just like um, Nathaniel Hawthorne's Scarlet Letter is a good version of that kind of literature. Mm -hmm. Although that kind of literature is depressing and hard to read. Yeah. That's, that's my point. I'm basically saying that Shane Claiborne's like the Scarlet Letter. (laughs) And on that bomb show. Yeah, that's a great show title. And that's, (laughs) you know, we should probably get out of here. Uh, Thank you so much for joining us for another sin boldly. Um, If you want to contact us, give us any feedback, um, Sin boldly at nfear.org, facebook.com slash the sign your name project, or at sin boldly on Twitter. And go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And end fear by signing your name. Good night. Shane Claiborne is basically the scarlet letter. Shane Claiborne, I love it. Hippie make no shower. from Shane Claiborne's people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm out there living like Jesus. Well, I mean, apparently mm. literally. <laughs>